Well, good evening, everybody. Happy New Year. Our apologies for a slight delay, but we just wanted to build the drama a little bit. No, actually, I sincerely apologize for that. So again, Happy New Year, everybody, and welcome to this installment of the Practice Perfection Web-Based Education Series. First of the year, better luck than never. I'm Danny Bobro, President of AIM Dental Marketing. Before we get to today's very special presentation, please allow me to share a few housekeeping matters with you. Today's presentation will run for around 90 minutes, as usual. You are welcome, again as usual, at any time to submit your questions using the question button on your screen. We will do our best to get all your questions answered, if not during the webcast, then shortly thereafter. As an attendee, you will be offered the opportunity to receive CE credit courtesy of Oral Biotech. Following the webcast, all attendees will be emailed a survey and quiz. You will then have 30 days to complete both the survey and quiz. Within 60 days of this, you will then receive an email with your CE certificate attached. I am joined this evening by Virginia Norton, who will field your questions during the presentation. Tonight's presentation is entitled, Adopt a Medical Model of Caries Risk Assessment and Treatment, and is being delivered by Dr. Kim Cooch. Dr. Cooch received his DMD from the University of Oregon School of Dentistry in 1979. A prolific international lecturer, he is also product consultant and inventor for air abrasion, lasers, and adhesive and cosmetic dentistry. As an author, Dr. Cooch has written dozens of articles and abstracts for both dental and medical journals on minimally invasive dentistry, laser dentistry, dental caries, and biofilm. He has also contributed to several texts, served as an editorial staff member for Reality, and sits on the editorial board of several dental journals. Dr. Cooch is a graduate of and mentor for the prestigious Coys Center in Seattle. As an inventor, Dr. Cooch holds numerous patents for air abrasion devices, powders and nozzles, as well as for cosmetic dental materials and methods. He is the former president of the International Academy of Laser Dentistry and the Academy of Laser Dentistry. He is also a fellow of the American Society of Lasers and Medicine and Dentistry and holds Category 3 Mastership in Lasers in Dentistry. He is founder, fellow diplomat, and first president of the World Congress of Minimally Invasive Dentistry. Additionally, Dr. Cooch serves on the board of directors for the World Clinical Laser Institute and also as a member of the ADA Dental Materials Laser Committee. In addition, he has served on the board of directors of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. Dr. Cooch was founder and president of Creative Microdentistry Systems, which developed the first minimally invasive dentistry system. He also regularly mentors dentists and dental study clubs on a variety of topics. He is a founding member of the Rendezvous Annual Dental Meeting in Baker City, Oregon. Dr. Cooch is a true pioneer, making constant strides towards the dental revolution, and all this while maintaining his patient-centered practice in Albany, Oregon. I met Kim at AOSH's scientific session on the Cleveland Clinic campus in 2012, and had the pleasure again of hearing him speak at AOSH's 2013 session in Las Vegas, which is what led me to extend this invitation to him and why I'm so excited he accepted. We could go on, but I know that uh, we owe you and Kim some, some time to make his presentation. So with that, let me just say that it is a sincere pleasure to introduce Dr. Kim Cooch. Hello, Kim. Hey, Danny. Thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me to, to speak with everybody tonight. Is the volume OK? You can hear me fine? Sounds good here. <clears throat> sincere okay, pleasure. OK, great. Well, I, I appreciate everybody being on with us tonight, and um, I've got some exciting stuff I want to share with everybody, and I, I know that some of you are buried in cold weather and, and uh, ice and snow, and uh, so whatever effort you've made to be with us tonight, I, I really appreciate. Um, starting my presentation tonight on the, uh, an updated model, a medical model of, of risk assessment as a way to manage dental caries, I think that all of us who practice today um, and if you've been practicing for a while, recognize that dental care is becoming a bigger and bigger challenge for us in, in terms of management in our practice. And so this was a journey that I started on about 15 years ago. And so tonight I want to just share with you kind of an insight of where that journey has led me and give you kind of an up-to-date look at um, what we know about this disease from a scientific standpoint 
how we've taken that information and developed a clinical model to, to use risk assessment based care to implement that and then you know again how we uh, implement that into our practice so uh, I, I look forward to sharing this with you I, we've got a, a lot of exciting stuff to talk about uh, just a, one last professional disclosure I always like to disclose I'm uh, in private practice three days a week here in Albany, Oregon. I do independent uh, carries research of my own within my practice and through the Forsyth Institute. Uh, and I'm also act as uh, CEO of Oral Biotech, the manufacturers of the carry free system. And, and I'll be talking about that system a little bit, as well as other ideas and products tonight, too. And I, and I am a banjo player, so uh, in case you didn't know that, you know that now. Uh, but it's one of the things I want to start. I mean, you drink. I'm sorry, what does PBR mean? Is it, you drink <laughs> PBR, Danny, that is a long story. Uh, but that's the name of our band. And uh, it, it's not the Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer. It actually uh, it, it came from the logo from the Professional Bull Riders Association. And uh, when we went to buy shirts the first time, uh, we found shirts that had this PBR logo on it. And I said, hey, guys, if we name our band PBR, we, we have our shirts already made. So uh, that's how that all evolved about <laughs> 15 years ago. It was, it was kind of... <laughs> kind of a random event. Um, so I, I want to start with tonight. I, I want to start with the Simon Sinek's uh, book, Start with Why. And he did a great uh, TED talk, uh, and it's worth looking up on YouTube if you haven't seen it. And the reason I want to start with Simon's information tonight is his whole concept is that people don't buy what you do; they buy why you do it. And if you think about things that you're passionate about or things that we purchase. You know, when I want to be around people that are passionate about you know what they do, and, and so it's really that passion that I, that I think that we're all drawn to. And your patients don't come to you because of the fact that you do um, you do fillings and crowns and root canals. They don't come to you because of you maybe lose, use a laser to do it. I mean, maybe some people do that, but it's not really the how and the what that they connect with you on. The reason that your patients come to you and come to you for you know 20, 30 years, and they're faithful you know, loyal patients with you is because of why you do what you do. They connect with you on why you're there. And if you're on this webinar tonight, you're passionate about what you do. And so I know that those patients connect with you because you're passionate, you love dentistry, you love helping people, and they're there because of that. And so I really think that, you know, we kind of, I think it's easy for us to, to get frustrated or discouraged or, you know, we battle diseases that are difficult to treat. And I Sometimes we can get cynical about patients not taking care of themselves. But I think if we go back and reconnect with that passion about why, remember every day when we walk into our office, why we're there, why we do what we do, um, I think that if we can help communicate that information to our patients, I think that really makes our lives um, just a lot more satisfying and rewarding. You know, so why am I here tonight? Well, I have to tell you, you know, we have a pandemic of, of dental caries, you know, that's a, a an international epidemic, and it's getting worse. Uh, when I graduated from dental school in 1979, they told me to, you know, make sure you plan for your retirement because 30 years from now there won't be dentists. We won't need dentists because of fluoride. You know, and the reality today is we've got more decay. We had a generation, you know, the the, the Y generation are by and large decay free, but the next generation coming up right at the moment have more decay than we had as children. And so, you know, fluoride isn't doing what it used to do. Um, and you know what we've been doing isn't working. You know the the drill and fill and the fit and fissure sealants. You know everything we do, the, the best that we have, still isn't enough. The decay rate in our in our zero to five year old kids in the United States is growing at, at double digits. And you know so it's like we're not we're not winning the battle here. And this is not okay with me. I've dedicated the rest of my career. You know and you make that decision at some point. It's like this is what I want to accomplish before I quit. This is what I want to do with the rest of my life. This became a mission for me. You know, this pandemic is not okay with me. It's not okay to see these little children suffer with decay, go into the operating room time and time again to, you know, be treated for a, a disease that's by and large preventable. I wouldn't tell you that my understanding of this disease today that is totally preventable. But I think that the public looks to us, the profession, to solve this problem. And so it's really our problem to solve, and we're not going to drill and fill our way out of it. It's not going to be some new magic bonding agent. There isn't going to be some new sealant that's going to cure this disease. It's really up to us to get to get on top of it and figure out what's causing it. So this is not this this pandemic is not okay with me, and that's what that's where my passion that what motivates me. And Danny, that's why I'm here with you tonight. You know, so when we stop and look at well, what's causing this pandemic? Well, when I was in dental school, I, I like to use this. Um, kind of concept of the usual suspects because we get we get into 
to Canberra carries management by risk assessment, and I tell you, it can, it can get very complicated very quickly, and it can get very confusing, and people will get kind of overwhelmed by it, and then they kind of give up. But, you know, if we really break it down to just simple pattern recognition, you know, when I was in dental school, you know, I was taught that dental caries was caused by mutant streptococci and lactobacillus, period, end of story. That's all it was. It was disease of these two bacteria. And now we know that, that <laughs> that's not even remotely close to being accurate in terms of our disease model. And I would share with you today that really I look at these factors really as it's really a bacterial issue. They either have too much bacteria or they have the wrong bacteria behaving wrongly in their mouth. Uh, it comes down to diet and typically there in that pattern of that disease. Patients either are eating too much simple sugar or they're eating too frequently during the day. Saliva is a huge issue today. I mean, the last patient I saw tonight before I came over here, her mouth is so dry that, I mean, even just trying to give her an injection, her, her cheek sticks to my glove. You know, so, and I know that you have patients like that, and so this is a huge issue for all of us that are practicing. And I added this suspect just a year ago. Genetics is really a wild card. There is so much research being done and published right at the moment on the genetic um, variations and, and susceptibilities to dental caries that this is truly a biofilm disease. And so when I said it's maybe not totally preventable, I mean, there are people that got, you know, dealt some bad genetics that, that make them, you know, susceptible to this disease. And I really can't change that. All we can do is try and help just reduce their exposure or reduce their risk. But at the end of the day, this comes down to Kaiser Sose. It's all about the pH. This is a dental caries is a disease of pH. If you have a bacterially um, oriented prolonged period of low pH in your mouth, which results in um, a net mineral loss, you have um, you have dental caries. And so, it, it all at the end of the day, whatever these other risk factors are, it all comes down to pH at the end of the day. So I try to encourage people to look at their patients and start thinking about what pattern is going on here. I mean, we're going to go through the risk assessment form. We're going to go through every step. We've got it systematized. But the one thing I want to do is start just looking at the pa look at your patients. Does this person have a dry mouth? Well, that's a problem for them, right? Or, you know, do you see their teeth are covered with plaque, okay? So there we've got a behavioral issue. That we know we've got too much bacterial load. But just start to try and identify um, the typical pattern that you see for this disease, and, and that will certainly simplify the process for you. You know, I mentioned bacteria, and I've got just a few slides I just want to update you on, and then we're going to go really through some scientific studies. But, you know, you know, we talked about bacteria as being a suspect, and at this point in time, there are over 50 bacteria, in fact, another one was just added, uh, that are potential cariogenic bacteria. You know, the most recent one that was added this last year was Propionobacterium acidophagens, and, you know, it, this, this list grows every year, and so it really comes down to not what bacteria are present, but really how are they behaving. Diet is a huge issue for Americans today, and I, and I think that diet changes as you see countries develop as well, but our problem in America is the average American eats 22.7 teaspoons of sugar per day in our diet, and when it comes to high fructose corn syrup, Americans are number one. We eat 51 pounds of high fructose corn syrup per person per year in the United States. Mexico, by the way, is number two, and they eat about 32 pounds of, of high fructose corn syrup. Um, not that high fructose corn syrup is a problem in dental caries per se, but it certainly is a, is a health problem for us. But it just comes back to our entire diet, and we, we consume way too much sugar, so that is an issue. Um, saliva. You know, we talk about saliva, and the biggest challenge that we all see with saliva is, is medication-induced xerostomy or hyposalivation. This came out of the Mayo Clinic this last June. By survey, 70% of all Americans take at least one prescription medication per day. More than 50% take two or more, and 20% take five or more medications per day. Um, there were 4.02 billion prescriptions written last year in the United States for a total of $320 billion. So, you know, when you look at this, you know, you see this every day. I know you see patients that come in with pages of medications. They come in, it used to be, I mean, when I started practicing dentistry, I swear, there, you know, the PDR had two pages in it, and there were only like three drugs, and I knew what they did. You know, today I have patients that come in, and they're taking like 15 or 20 medications every day, and it's no wonder they have a dry mouth. We know that the number one side effect from prescription medications, number one, is xerostomia. So that becomes a huge problem. The saliva is the protective 
vehicle in the mouth. It's alkaline and it raises the pH to get it back into a healthy zone. It drives remineralization. It protects us from those bacteria. And it's like without that saliva, that's a huge missing piece for these patients. And then the last thing that I wanted to share with you is genetics. And this study was done uh, and published. There have been 11 studies published in the last three years. There was one just published in the last month. Um, but looking at different aspects that um, of genetics, of inherited traits that make somebody predisposed to an increased rate of or risk of dental caries. And this study was done, this was a genome-wide association study, and we'll talk about it in a, in a little bit yet. But they found 10 major associations on the entire genome of 518,000 human genes. And this particular patient um, Kate was referred to me by a, a local pediatric dentist, and they have refilled her mandibular incisors like three times. And she continues to get decay just on her mandibular incisors. Well, I want you to stop and think for a second. Those are the last men standing. If a patient has six teeth, we all know which six they are. If they have two teeth, we know which ones they are. These are the teeth that are the most protected with the most saliva throughout the entire day. So it's like these are the teeth that should be the last people to get decay. And when you look at a mouth and these are the only teeth that get decay, there's something else going on there. And it turns out that this person has a deficiency in a bacteriolytic enzyme called Lysel-2. And so I saw this patient. I had just read that study. And this patient and her mother are sitting you know, in my operatory. And, and I took a look at the patient. We looked. I went through the entire review. And I looked at the mother. And I said, your, you know, your daughter has a, a, a bacterial enzyme deficiency of Lysel-2. And she had this stunned look on her face, like, how could you possibly know that? Well, I know that because I read the research, and this is the exact pattern for this disease. And so it's like, you know, not that I can fix a genetic issue, but at least I can help the patient understand why this is happening, and let's do the best we can to, to work around that. So I talked about starting with why. This patient came to me a couple of years ago in my practice. Um, this is Albany, Oregon. You know, I see patients. This is a 45-year-old woman. And her dentist, her previous dentist, one year ago, had placed six porcelain fused metal crowns on her maxillary incisors. Well, and within one year, two of them are already gone. And I, get, I have to tell you that it wasn't much longer before those failed as well. But the problem here isn't as, I mean, it's, it's easy to say, well, you know, what was going on? But it, it wasn't a what problem. And how are we going to fix it? You know, we were treated to treat it with a drill, you know, drilling drill and fill, you know, it, but her problem isn't really, you can't drill and keep up with this disease. This really isn't a what problem and a how problem, it's really a why problem. And the whole point of Canberra, the whole point of this message tonight is, when you look at your patients, if you can figure out why their mouth looks the way it does, why they have the disease, you have the opportunity to really make a breakthrough and help that patient. You can change their life. So the real question I have for you tonight is, you know, do you want to spend the, continue to spend the rest of your, your career drilling and filling and chasing this disease, or do you want to actually um, change how you practice um, and become more effective at managing this to help people become healthy? I, this patient came to me um, just a year ago. And really, this is the state of dentistry today. So I want to take you where we are today, and I want to show you what's possible on this journey. It's kind of a hero's journey for all of you. You know, there's struggles along the way. I mean, it's not easy, and it can be confusing. I want to try and make it clear and simplify that process for you tonight. But the reason why would you go through this journey, I think, is best, is best explained by this patient. This is a 14-year-old girl. Her mother brought her to me. She had heard about my practice. She heard about what I do. And by the way, when you start treating these kind of patients and you implement camera in your practice, patients like this will find you. Um, you know, the word of mouth, this is a life-changing experience for people that are suffering from this disease. This is a 14-year-old girl. She has 17 crowns on her, on her permanent teeth. Um, she has two root canals, and she needs four more crowns. She's 14 years old, and she's had 17 crowns. And so the first question I ask the mother is, she's been to three different dentists, and all they keep doing is just keep putting more crowns on her teeth. And I said, do you have any idea what's causing this problem for your daughter? And nobody had ever talked to her. Nobody had ever asked, gee, let's figure out, what, let's get to the bottom of this. What was happening was, oh, there you go. You've got a new cavity. You need a crown. Get me a schedule to find where you do the crown. And nobody was asked stopping to go, why do you need another crown? Why is this happening to your daughter? Because think about this. If this was your 14-year-old daughter 
and you were going through the expense and the trauma, you know, and the frustration with your child, and nobody ever talked to you about it, and other than just, you know, put crowns on their teeth. And then somebody sat down and said, well, let's figure out, let's get to the bottom and figure out why this is happening so we can maybe have a chance of correcting that. That was a life-changing experience for those patients. And if you have the power and the ability to help people like that, I would, I'm going to tell you it's going to change your practice. And, and it's going to change your practice for the better. So that's really what's possible. I think there's, there's, uh, there's a black cloud coming for dentistry. I mean, I, I'm pretty much alarmed. And I don't think that we as a profession really see it yet. But, you know, Obamacare, you know, rolled out uh, January 1st, and I'm already getting phone calls from, you know, our Oregon Dental Service, the, our Delta branch, telling us not to call them for a pre-op because they're fielding 30,000 phone calls a day, people concerned about their dental coverage, confused by this whole issue. They can't even answer all of the phone calls. And the challenge is, is that large employers, and you're going to see this in your area, I'm already seeing it here, large employers are going to have to uh, meet the requirement for the mandate to carry medical insurance or provide that as a benefit for their employees, and the expense of that is going to be they're going to they're going to drop dental insurance. And when that happens to a practice, these are the statistics: 57% of people in the United States currently have dental insurance. Of those with insurance, 81% of them see their dentist twice a year. Of the uninsured, the other 43%, only 34% of them go to the dentist twice a year. And 44% of them cite lack of insurance or cost of dental care as the reason. So one of the things that may happen as a result of Obamacare that I see coming for all of us to deal with is as patients lose their dental insurance, one of the challenges that we're going to have is they're going to move from coming in 81% of them coming in twice a year to only 34% of them coming in twice a year. So, And I can tell you from firsthand experience, uh, when one of the major employers in town lost their, their insurance coverage 20 years ago, those patients in my practice quit coming to see me. They came in when they had a toothache, but they didn't come in twice a year for their care. So those are the kind of challenges that I see coming for us that we need to be prepared for. And, it, and I can't think of a better way to change your practice than to implement Canberra. People are going to become more health conscious as a result of Obamacare, which is a good thing. They're also going to become a lot more value conscious, like wellness conscious in the process. So this is a real opportunity for all of us um, as there's going to be a, a kind of an interesting transition here in the next two or three years, and I don't think anybody really knows what the ultimate outcome is going to look like. So I talked a little bit about kind of the model for this disease. I want to bring you up to date on some of the scientific studies, just you know, kind of give you an up-to-date kind of look at this. Um, Dental caries today has multiple pathogens. We talked about that. It has systemic effects, and it may have uh, hereditary components as well. This is a study from Ann Tanner's group. This was published in uh, 2011. She identified Scardovia wigsii as an additional bacteria that was found in children with severe early childhood caries. You know, it used to be called early childhood caries, and now it's called severe early childhood caries because um, early childhood caries with a child that had a cavity before the age of three years of age, and now we see children that have a mouthful of decay by the time they're, you know, 20, 24 months of age. So, but the point I want to make here is that, you know, it isn't just mutant streptococci. And she followed the study up later that year in November and identified yet another new bacteria, Slacky exigua, that was found in children again with, um, with early childhood care, severe early childhood caries. And the interesting note from this study, I've been kind of um, describing dental caries from a different pattern of risk group, like I just showed you those usual suspects. And Anne was the first person that I've seen also say for the first time, based on the data in this study, that the children really broke into two groups. They either had a bacterial problem in their mouth or they had a dietary issue. So other researchers have started to identify as well, this isn't just a disease of uh, mutant streptococci or whatever bacteria, but there's actually other risk factors and there's patterns for this disease that are separate from that. And they're, they're, they're pretty easy to identify. So her data actually broke into this. These children either had a bacterial issue or they had a dietary issue. I talked about the, the um, propionibacteria acidophages. This was Diana Wolf's group out of Germany. They took uh, 26 uh, Carries high carries adults and 28 carries free individuals. They did a you know a, a checkerboard DNA spectrum looking at 43 different bacteria, and the only bacteria 
that was significantly associated differently between healthy and, and uh, dental caries patients was uh, propionibacteria acidophagia patients. So, you know, here, this is out of the blue. You get a new bacteria that, that shows up. When I said there were some systemic effects, and, and Danny, I talked about this, you know, the last two years at, at AOSH, you know, we, we're all aware of the, um, the systemic effects from periodontal pathogens, and I think, you know, the public is generally aware of that association as well. In fact, you know, the, the medical profession is becoming, I, I think, better uh, educated in terms of periodontologies. One of the things that I've seen, there's a tremendous amount of scientific research and literature looking at some of the bacteria that are found in the plaque that's growing in the arteries and in the, um, on the heart valves. It turns out the other oral bacteria that are there and actually there in higher numbers than the periodontal pathogens tend to be some of the other oral bacteria. Number one turns out to be uh, strep mutans. Um, and so that, you know, the conclusion actually from this study, this came out of Japan, Nakano study came out of Tokyo, Japan. Uh, they looked at 300 specimens just, you know, at the, um, random specimens taken at the, during operations, you know, open heart surgery, and found that the number one bacteria, when it was positive for strep mutans in the mouth, 78% of the time they found strep mutans on the heart valve and in the coronary artery plaque. So we know that these bacteria get into the, systemically get into our bloodstream, and they may have other outcomes that we're not even yet fully versed in. One thing we do know about mutant streptococci is that they have a gene, we've identified the gene, that allows them to directly invade endothelial cells. So these bacteria can actually get immediately into an arterial endothelial cell. So that makes them a lot more pathogenic as well. So, you know, we're, again, we're learning more and more about this as time goes by, but, but there's a tremendous amount of work being done. Um, then I'm just going to share with you a few of the genetic studies. This is one of the early ones. It was just done three, published four years, it will be four years ago now. They looked at 300 random individuals, and the beta defensin 1 gene, there are three different polymorphisms for that gene. And beta defensin 1 is a bacterial, um, bacteriolytic enzyme found in the saliva. It's a protective enzyme found in our saliva. And there are three different potential variations, genetic variations for individuals around that one bacteriolytic enzyme. Turns out the group that carry the um, G20A copy or polymorphism of that had DMFT and DMFS scores that were five times higher than the people in the other groups. And I tell you, when you get to an odds ratio of five, that's huge. So it's like what that means is if you've got that person, they may have a deficiency of a bacteriolytic enzyme that's going to make them five times more susceptible to tooth decay than other than the other two groups of people around that. And you know, there, I think there's 2,260 different proteins found in the saliva. That's just one of them. So you know, it, this disease gets a little more complex as we talk about it. Certainly, the, the these little kids that are called super tasters, the TAS 2R38 gene for bitterness, they really pick up phenols. They're highly susceptible and do not like uh, certain green vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, um, Brussels sprouts. Um, and then you've also got the TAS 1R2 sweet gene, and these kids have sweet have a sweet tooth. And you know, given a choice between uh, green vegetables and candy, this kid's going to opt for the candy. Uh, but you've got some kids who'd rather have fruit or, or you know vegetables. So you know, we know that those play a role. Just our taste buds and the genetic factors play a role. I thought this was very interesting. This is the um, matrix metalloproteinase is found in the dentin, and those enzymes. Um, either aid in or prevent the or uh, the degradation of, of the proteins in the dentin as the dentin is, is you know breaks down, and so here we are now talking about you know we talked about taste buds and bacteriolytic enzymes, and as you start looking at the variation of where some of these genetic factors come from, people that had a mutation for uh, the SMMP13 uh, in their dentin actually you know greatly reduced their risk for dental caries, and so. You know, we started looking across the board. This was a study that was published uh, a year ago on adolescents on the human leukocyte antigen, the DQ2 antigen, on, and the people that had, had positive for this antigen, again, were um, greatly reduced their risk for dental caries. So now we're talking about antigens present on white blood cells, and this list just goes on and on. I mean, we're continuing to make discoveries. And here was the Schaefer-Feingold study, <clears throat> this genome-wide association study looking at 518,000 gene sites, you know, on 920 adults and coming up with, 
you know, 10 major associations, the strongest of which happen to be the Lysel 2 enzyme. But, you know, it just points out that, you know, we start looking at this and genetically there's a lot of, of um, I guess there's a lot of risk or potential there to, to make somebody susceptible to this disease. And, you know, that's not something that you and I think about every day. You sit on the patient and you explore in your mirror <clears throat> or your three-word syringe and you're looking at the radiographs and you're talking to the patient. I'm thinking bacteria and diet, home care. I'm thinking about these kind of issues or maybe, you know, xerostomia. And I don't always just start to think, I wonder if they have a genetic, you know, challenge going on here. And that's not something that we have a test for yet. But I think certainly as time goes by, there, these are things, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years from now that we may routinely be able to test for. Takahashi and NEVAD, in my mind, have, in the last 10 years, have come up with, I think, the greatest clarification. Uh, they've published some really landmark studies, in my mind, in terms of describing this disease. And... Uh, this study was published two years ago, but they really have broken the, the entire decay process down into kind of three stages. You know, the dynamic stability stage, the healthy person, you know, the enamel, you know, dissolves when they eat, and 30 minutes later, you know, based on the Stefan curve, the, you know, the calcium phosphate go back into the enamel and it remineralizes, and they have, so they have this kind of balance going on. And then, the, you know, if there's a shift change and there's a pH shift in the mouth, you know, it favors the acidogenic bacteria. And so you really get into a, a point where there are more acidogenic bacteria in the mouth, and then finally, as, as it progresses, it ends up into the acid-uric stage where the bacteria that are present, you know, really are tolerant of a low pH. At this point in time, <coughs> we really end up with a point where you've got a huge shift and change in the biofilm on the teeth, and this person then starts to, to then have cavitation develop in their mouth. The point here being is it's not which bacteria are present, it's not this, it's the environment and acidification is the main determinant of what happens in those bacteria. Now, an, another very interesting study, and this was just published, Danny, and I don't have it in my PowerPoint, but um, this was just published last month in the Journal of Dental Research, and, I, and I'm bringing it up because I think it's very interesting. <clears throat> it's the first paper that's really described it this way, but it really talks about dental caries being a tissue-dependent disease. So they looked at what are the bacteria they did the DNA checkerboard analysis? They looked at which bacteria are present on a healthy tooth. And then they looked at white spot lesions and what kind of bacterial change is there. Then they looked at, you know, early dentin lesions and what does it look like, and then deep carious lesions, and what happens to the bacteria as this disease progresses through those different layers of tissue. And what they discovered was on the surface there was a thousand, over a thousand uh, different operational taxonomic units, there was basically a thousand different bacteria on the surface of a healthy tooth. When it got to the point where there was a white spot lesion, there was only 193 different bacteria, which tells you there's fewer bacteria that are, are um, developed that can, you know, habitate in that kind of environment. And that was predominantly strep mutans, strep gornii, or gordonii, mitis, and sanguinis. When it got to an early dental lesion, it increased in the number of, of bacterial species to 350, but it was predominated by bacteria like Prevotella and Strep Midas. And when it got deep into the, into the dentin, again, the tissue changed which bacteria, the environment changed, and the, the tissue and the environment changed which bacteria were present. And really, it was Strep uh, Cristatus and uh, Lactobacillus and also Candida were the three primary organisms found growing there. So when you look at this disease and you just, you know, throw away the Strep Mutans Lactobacillus model because as the tissue changes and the lesion progresses into the tooth, which bacteria and how many different types of bacteria are present changes along with the tissue and the environment. I thought it was a really well um, described and, and written study. I just wanted to bring that one up for you tonight. Um, this was a paper that was published by Lizzie Booten in the uh, Nature magazine back in 2010, and, and it's a very interesting concept that's gaining traction right now amongst biofilm researchers. Biofilms don't behave as a cluster, a community of bacteria. They really behave as a single organism. If you can think of a biofilm as a super organism, these bacteria, um, they exchange DNA. 25% of the bacteria of the DNA found in a given bacterial cell is not of its own origin. It's not even from its own species. So they share DNA, so it doesn't really matter 
uh, which bacteria there because they're sharing all that DNA anyway. And so it, it really acts and behaves like this cluster of bacteria in the biofilm as a superorganism. And we should start thinking about biofilms as a superorganism. Well, Takahashi and Nevad took that paper, took that principle and applied it to dental caries, and they came up with this. It really doesn't matter which bacteria are present. What matters is which genes are present because the genes determine what expression is happening within that biofilm. It doesn't matter which bacteria, it's which genes are there. And then it's not just the genes present, but which ones are being expressed, because that produces the metabolism for that biofilm. And in the case of dental caries, if it's causing acid output, causing caries formation, that's what we need to be concerned about. So we really need to, with these uh, genomic-wide studies that we can do now, the next level of science that we're going to see on the biofilms looking at dental caries is going to get more focused on, you know, really what is the, the biofilm doing rather than which bacteria are present. So we've been really, I think, focused on which bacteria are there. And, and in reality, we really need to just think about, forget the bacteria. We need to figure out what's happening with that biofilm because it's producing acid for long periods of acid. This person has dental caries. So it's really the functioning not the composition is where our research needs to be focused going forward. That kind of gives you a you know January 2014 update on the I think the most relevant uh, dental research when it comes to dental caries. Um, one other paper that I would share with you uh, is it, based on sugar, and that was just published. I just got this on Monday of this week in the January issue of Dental uh, Journal of Dental Research, and it was a, a, a systematic review looking at sugar and dental caries rates, and they looked at it globally. So these studies, they, they picked up 5,990 studies. Uh, at, you know, as they filtered through those, they included 55 of them in the, in the systematic review. Uh, three were like intervention studies, eight were cohort studies. You had population studies. You had cross-sectional studies. There were no longitudinal studies in there, however. Then it was on adults and children, and it was from China to New Zealand to African countries to European countries to the United States. So it was really a global study, and they looked at how did the sugar in the diet affect the caries rate within those populations or within those studies. And they, the cutoff points they used were 10% of the dietary energy and less than 5% of the dietary energy coming from directly from sugar. And what they found was they found a significant relationship between the sugar and the caries rate um, throughout the studies. Uh, when it was 10% of the diet or less, they had a moderately, you know, I would say moderate strength in terms of the confidence of the, of the research, but uh, the, pre the predictability based on the less than 5% you know, sugar they had, again, a significant outcome, but the, the weight of the scientific evidence was very low or poor. So, and the other point they made in this, in this review was that even when they got below 5% sugar, people still had dental caries. It wasn't like, well, if you eliminated sugar from our diet, and I've talked about sugar tonight and how much we consume, even if you eliminate it, you're not going to eliminate disease because this isn't a disease of sugar, right? It's not a disease of mutant streptococci. It's not a disease of just oral medications. You know, it, it's, and it's not just a disease of genetics. It's multifactorial. And so if we take a single factorial approach in our therapy, which is kind of, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, that's going to work for the people that that was their problem, but it's not going to do anything for the other groups. So we come to Canberra then. The whole purpose of Canberra is to figure out why. Carries management by risk assessment. I want to know what's causing that problem for that patient. One of the things that, you know, this is Edwina Kidd and, and Fedrikoff's book on dental caries, you know, and the text that I, that I refer to frequently, but, you know, too late we figured out that, you know, drill and fill, this patient, you know, you couldn't drill and fill and keep up with this patient. You, you know, and it just doesn't happen. But you can keep up with a patient when you can identify what the problem is. Here's a person in first stage therapy. She's got glass ionomer restorations now, and we're dealing with her with her behaviors. You know, and, and trying to help her get healthy. Um, we know that it's based on risk factors, and they're common risk factors. They've been well documented. So rather than trying to treat the lesions and treat the signs and symptoms, we really need to get back to treating the cause, identifying what those are. You know, and this was uh, uh, Sophia Damagene's uh, project with Joel White and uh, John Featherstone at UCSF, and this was published uh, last year, and it was published in the Carries Research Journal this last year as well. 
they took, it was a retrospective study, a six-year study looking at 12,954 patients at the University of California San Francisco Dental School. And what they did in the study was they identified different risk factors amongst the different populations, people that were determined to be high risk, extreme risk, high risk, moderate risk, and low risk, and then looked in the following six years and looked at, at each of these risk groups, what happened, what was the outcome. And in the, so in the process, they were able to identify that there were four risk factors that were so strong that they weren't really risk factors, but instead they're really disease indicators. If you have any one of those things, you have the disease. Then they identified the risk factors based on odds ratios, and then we started looking at the bacteria that were present. Interesting, what they found in their, in their population at the dental school was 15 and a half were classified as low risk, 22% were classified as moderate risk, and about 63% were classified as high risk or extreme risk. Now, I did the same study, a multi-site study with five different dental practices. We're almost up to 10,000 patient data points. And um, what we've determined is that we only found about 4% of the patients were truly low risk based on the ADA uh, definition of low risk. Uh, we found more people in the moderate risk and then and about the same in the higher extreme risk. And uh, in conversations I've had with Dr. Featherstone, you know, subsequent to this, he said um, something like 28% of the patients that were diagnosed as low risk or identified as low risk actually developed a cavity in the first year. And so he thought that that probably in their, um, in their study, the number of low risk patients was probably overstated. Now, but the important thing for your patients to know is if they're diagnosed or in your practice as high risk or extreme risk for dental caries, if they're high risk for dental caries, they have a 75% chance that they're going to have a new cavity in the next 12 months. You know, so if that's okay with them, then they should keep doing what they're doing and we'll all just go on our way. And if they're extreme risk, their their odds of having a new cavity in the next 12 months is 88%. So, if, you know, if we just keep drilling and filling and, you know, they're high risk and we don't change anything else about that, they're going to continue to, you know, we're going to continue can continue to drill and fill until they run out of teeth or die. Um, so I think that's important information. Being high risk means something. You know, if if, if you have, if you if you uh, qualify as high risk for dental caries based on this information, you know, there's a 75 percent chance you're going to have a new cavity next year. Well, that's a conversation I think that we need to have with our patients so that they understand that. Now, as complicated as you know this journey can become, and you know, I started this journey about 14 years ago and it was I made it very complicated for myself at the outset um, the best thing that we can do is simplify it you know uh, to make this as simple as possible so I really started with this analogy for my patients I don't sit and talk about propionic bacteria acid patients with my patients we don't talk about that at all what I really want to get across to them is that 30 second elevator conversation when you're sitting in my chair today I'm going to treat you differently than I did before uh, if you're a new patient to my practice, I'm going to treat you differently than your previous dentist probably did. And here's a reason for that. You know, I, and I can tell patients very quickly, you know, getting a cavity is a lot like getting a nail in your tire. And what I traditionally was taught to do is every time you got a nail in your tire, it's like fix your tire. And the problem isn't, isn't that you have a nail in your tire, however. The problem is that you have nails in your driveway. And so, if we continue to just treat the nails in your tire every time you get that and leave the nails in your driveway, you know, what's going to happen? And I can help you figure out why you have nails in your driveway. And if we sweep the driveway and get it clean, uh, we still have to repair the tire. But if I get rid of the nails in your driveway, you'll stop getting nails in your tire. And they'll finish the sentence for you. And I don't have to talk about bacteria or anything else. That explains the concept. We're here to figure out what's causing this disease and treat that instead. And I, I, I have to tell you that the acceptance for this is almost universal. I have not had any patient that said, no, I don't want to do that. You know, I'd rather you just drill and fill my teeth until, you know, until I die. Um, so we start within that assessment. We start with risk assessment. We use a risk assessment form. Now, there's a number of different forms available. This is data that the questions on this form uh, we designed, but the data we took from John Featherstone with his permission from his study. So some of this data you'll find on, on hopefully on several of the other forms. That's the best validated study, clinical study, on, on these questions and these risk factors that's been published uh, that I'm aware of. So you know, we start with the risk assessment form. We'll go through this step by step so you kind of get a feel for it. 
But really, the whole point of this form, and I'll have, I'll have you know, professionals say to me, well, why do I need a risk assessment form? I, I can look in them out. They, they, they're high risk for dental caries. I already know that. The point of the form is we want to know why do they have dental caries, and it's asking those questions that we're going to get to figure out why. And sometimes the form won't answer it for you, and sometimes you have to play Columbo, like John Coyce here. You have to keep probing and asking deeper questions. I had a patient one time that, uh, you know, I asked her repeatedly about, you know, medications, and, and I, you know, went through this whole thing, and she had gone from being healthy to having to extracting two teeth, literally in a 10-month span of time. And I'm like, what happened here? You know, let's talk about your diet. Let's talk about what's changed. Are you taking any medications? And we went through this, and over and over, and I left the room, and, and I scratched my head. I couldn't come up with anything at all. And I finally came back, and I said, you know, do you ever feel like you have a dry mouth? Oh, I have the worst dry mouth. Ever since I started taking this antihistamine for my sinus infection and the, all the antibiotics they've given me, and, and, and I was like, I asked you at least five times if you're taking any medications, and each time you said no. And in her mind, antihistamines and, and antibiotics weren't medications. She thought I was talking about heart pills and other things. So it's like, you know, you just keep have to play Columbo to, to get to the bottom of that and answer that for that. Um, we started this uh, form probably three or four years ago now, uh, but we started with, I'm going to talk about wellness coaching before we quit tonight, so you kind of get into the behavioral. I know, Danny, that's one of your things is the clinical and the communication, and uh, you know, and, and I want to get into that tonight. Mm -hmm. um, but So we, uh, looking at just motivational interview questions, I really want to know where the patient is coming from. You know, would you like a free screening test today? And you get all kinds of weird answers from that, and not everybody says yes. But if diagnosed at risk for cavities, would you be interested in discussing treatment options? Like instead of drill and fill, let's talk about, you know, what's, you know, how we can help you manage that disease. And if and if needed, would you be willing to modify your dietary habits? And surprisingly, I think more people optimistically say yes to that than I think they're probably, um, you know, capable of or, or really can intend to do. But it gives me an right out of the gate when I look at the risk assessment form, I know that this is somebody that, that can do, will do, or won't do. And not that if they say no, that that closes the door and I'm not going to bring it up. It, it gives me the opportunity to ask a different question, like, gee, I find it really interesting you have like 12 new cavities today, and, and you're not really curious to know why you're having cavities, you're not interested in, in having a conversation about that. You know, that's interesting. Tell me about that. Uh, something is non judgmental. I just find it interesting. Tell me about that. It opens a door for for a continued conversation on that, and then they may, you know, it may be the wrong timing, or maybe something they don't care about. You get all kinds of different responses, but you get to figure out where they're coming from very quickly. Right, at least you know. At least you know. At least you know. You know and, and rather than making an assumption, point, at least it might just be a matter of them needing to hear it a few times. And and no doesn't mean no; it means not now. Right. Exactly, Danny. I, that that's that's so right on. It's like maybe. You know, after I hear it, you know, what do, we, what do we have to hear something 14 times in a sales pitch before the average person says yes to it? Um, this isn't a sales pitch, but I mean, but, you know, we have to hear the information over and over maybe before we're receptive to it. Or maybe they didn't hear it, you know, maybe the way that I presented it the first time didn't connect for them, right? And so, you know, it's something that we keep probing with. But I, those three questions are really invaluable. Then we just look at the risk factors, and you you know if you notice plaque buildup on your teeth, that's the number one risk factor is hot, is too much bacterial load. You take medications daily. Do uh, you feel like you have a dry mouth? What do you drink? Uh, you know, other than water, more than two times a day in between meals, snacking. You know, so those are the those are straight from John Featherstone, and then these again are straight from John Featherstone as well. You know, new progressing visible cavitations, new progressing approximal radiographic radiolithencies. You can tell we had a uh, radiographer on our team. Uh, new active white spot lesions, or is there decay history a concern? You know, one of the things that a lot of insurance companies in the ADA are using to qualify this, have you had a cavity in the last year? Have you had a three cavities in the last three years? And everybody's kind of pulling these numbers out of their hat, but there hasn't been a lot of research based on how many cavities. I haven't seen any published validated studies that say if you've had one cavity in the last year, you're high risk, or if you, you know, if it's been three years since you've had a cavity. Uh, but it, decay history, we know, certainly is a risk factor, or a disease indicator, rather. And then biofilm challenge. Early in, the, in my early days, I was culturing butane cyclococcus and lactobacillus. That's a model that really doesn't work well in clinical practice. And we really came down to looking at ATP as a way to measure bacterial load. So I just get a quick, I, it's a 15-second chair site test. I know immediately 
I can get a baseline on a patient, I can follow them with this, and I know immediately whether they, that bacterial issue is an issue or not. You know, so looking at that biometric, you know, there's a, a aluminometer and, and swab, just a simple test if you haven't seen it. It's based on the principle that bacteria that live in an acid uric environment have a hydrogen ion pump mechanism in their cell, and that's how they maintain intracellular neutrality while they're living in this harsh, acidic environment. They're adapted for that. Well, that uses up to 100 times as much ATP as a bacteria that's just living in a neutral environment. So ATP then becomes a marker for uh, bacterial load, also became a marker for this disease as well, identifying kind of the bacterial load specifically of, of uh, acid uric type bacteria being predominant in the biofilm. Um, and we did a number of studies, there's been uh, numerous studies now that have been published using ATP and uh, this method to look at caries risk, how does it relate directly to caries risk, to bacterial load, to uh, the specific bacteria that are present. You could have a high bacterial load and have healthy bacteria there and not have any decay. Um, so it's not a linear, you know, if you have high bacterial load, you have lots of um, caries causing bacteria. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, but so we've actually used this as a metric, and it seems to be quite uh, uh, quite predictive, better than anything else that we have, and it's simple and share side. So I like to depend on that. We get to the diagnosis step, and now it's really a point of you taking all of that information. All, you're the detective here. Take all your data points. You've spoken to all the witnesses. You've examined all of the you know the the information, and it's like now you need to to make a um, a decision for this patient, like where do they fall, and, and what happens? You know, what what is the problem? Why is this happening? Now, the ADA Council on Scientific Affairs gave us guidelines for these. This was uh, in the August six or August two thousand and six rather special supplement to the um, to JADA, and this was on uh, professional, I think, prescriptive fluoride use. But it was buried in that article. But it gave us for the first time somebody came, you know, stepped up and said, okay, here's how we're going to, you know, classify these different risks. Um, so low carries, moderate, you know, and we break, typically in the research, we break uh, people into two groups, either six and under or six and over, I'm, you know, over the age of six. So primarily we're talking about children, zero to five age children, or we're talking about six to adult. Um, and so that's kind of how we break that down. Now new for 2014, and I'm really excited about this, is for the first time we have CDT codes for carries risk assessment and documentation with a finding, not a diagnosis, but with a finding of low risk using a recognized risk assessment tool. And so we have codes now that doesn't, doesn't mean that necessarily every insurance plan is going to reimburse for that, but the one thing that we have now is codes for the first time. And there are insurance companies that are starting to re uh, reimburse for this. They, they believe that this has tremendous value in terms of providing better treatment outcomes long term, uh, greater predictive treatment outcomes, and so you're going to see this uh, I think develop within your own communities over time, but we need to start using these codes. One thing that uh, you know, it's really on us the profession. If we don't use the codes, the insurance companies won't write products for it. So that's something that we need to look at and use. And I'm excited to have those. Um, and then you come down to a professional assessment summary. You know, and the way that I do this is um, I really want to know: Are the risk factors a concern? You know, yeah, the patient is slightly zero stomach, they're a mouth breather, that makes them moderate risk, you know, based on the ADA, but they haven't had cavity in 30 years. Well, you know, that's not really a concern to me. It seems to be manageable at the moment. Uh, I might make some recommendations to the patient, but I really want to know rather than this isn't just a check this box and if it's here, I really want you to, to use some applied thinking here, critical thinking. You know, is that a concern to this patient realistically? You know, are the disease indicators a concern? Probably they would be, you know, and the, and the biofilm challenge. You may be sitting with a person that has a high biofilm challenge, but they don't have any decay. Uh, you know, maybe just strictly a home care issue. Uh, you know, is it a concern in terms of their risk? Yeah, it's a potential concern, but what I really need to focus with them on is help them understand that it's a risk, and if they want to reduce their risk, you know, here's what here's the measures that we should take. So it gives us the opportunity to kind of work into those targeted therapeutic conversations that we're going to have with the patient, and then we put a grid down you know, just low risk, moderate, high, high risk, and, and higher extreme risk. And I would tell you that I use the ATP bioluminescence. Uh, I use that data point. We have high risk patients. You have some patients that have a high biofilm load and they have no 
disease in it, they don't have any cavities, and then you have some patients that have a low load and they have cavities. And so what I would tell you, for the patients that have a low bacterial load, they don't have a bacterial problem. Like you need to be looking at uh, their diet, you need to be looking at their saliva is the first place I would go. And you may start thinking about a genetic issue, but if they have a low bacterial load and they have cavities, you're not dealing with a bacterial issue. To put that person on an antimicrobial agent is a waste of time. They don't have a bacterial problem. So it's like we need to look at, we need to start talking and try and figure out what the problem is and focus on that. On the other hand, the person that has a high bacterial load but doesn't have any cavities yet, uh, it wouldn't take much for that person to express this disease. So in having that conversation, there's a person that may benefit from an antimicrobial agent in terms of helping reduce their overall bacterial load and talk about you know, helping them with their home care. Um, and then you've got the group that have the risk factors, they have the cavities, and they have a high bacterial challenge. And those are the people that we're really going to go after with a lot of different strategies to try and help them. And you know, phase three then is prescribed therapy. And when I stopped and, you know, with my team, we stopped and looked at, well, what really kind of therapeutic options do we have? Well, in my mind, it breaks down again. It's, I can remember three things. This is kind of a common theme you'll see <laughs> in my life. If I can break it into three categories, I can remember those. But number one is reparative. We still have to fix the tire. And, you know, I can maybe do some remineralization along with those restorations. You know, the second step in, in terms of prescribing therapy is therapeutic. What kind of things can I prescribe for this patient or have them use that are going to improve their um, the therapy or their outcome? And then the last is behavioral. What kind of behavioral issues do they have? Uh, you know, and we're going to talk about some of those that are potentially modifiable, some of those potentially aren't modifiable. And so, how do we how do we deal with those behavioral issues? <clears throat> And so when we start then with reparative, uh, certainly, you know, the one thing that we know, um, the treatment, again, this is, this is my mentor, Edwina Kidd. She is a, just one of the world's leading experts in dental caries and, and a, a delightful individual from the UK. And anytime I get stuck, I always email Edwina, and she, she always gives me a very honest answer. Sometimes I don't want to hear them, but, but I, she's somebody that I can bounce a lot of different ideas off. But this is, again, from a, a paper that she wrote and published last year, control of the biofilm is the treatment of dental caries. I mean, you know, I mean that this, that sentence says it all, and it's you know most important being to disturb the biofilm mechanically using a fluoride-containing toothpaste. You know, I would say maybe you know maybe there's even more than that to it, but certainly control the biofilm. That is the treatment for dental caries. You know, drilling drilling and filling is is not the treatment for this disease. That's a treatment for just the, the destruction caused by the disease. So I think about therapeutics. I really break it down into there's five different categories. Um, if there were six, it, it would be um, probiotics. I don't think probiotics are, are ready for prime time yet just yet, looking at the research on them. But I, I, I hold that out as an interesting sixth possibility here. But certainly, the way the body does it is the saliva. That's the number one protective mechanism, and the way the body does in the saliva, in addition to the antibacterial, you know, enzymes and what have you, is pH. This is strictly a disease of pH, and you know, the if we look at um, resting saliva, the pH is 6.7, 6.75. Stimulated pH. When you start to eat, the saliva is already trying to protect the teeth, and that stimulated saliva should have a pH of 8.0. So when you take that saliva away. Um, you know, you put a serious, you know, um, uh, impact on the entire system and the health and the balance of that system. So one of the ways that we can maybe help recreate that balance is by creating therapies that raise the pH in the patient's mouth. Um, we've got antimicrobials or antibacterial agents. Uh, we'll talk about those individually. Uh, fluoride, certainly fluoride has been huge for us. I still am an advocate of fluoride. Um, I, you know, we keep using higher and higher doses, and it seems to have a, a lesser and less return. But, um, but I still believe in fluoride as a, as a very important part of this regimen. Xylitol, we're going to talk about that. I'll share some of the science of xylitol with you, and then um, calcium phosphate in some form. And there's a lot of different forms of that on the market, but uh, I favor nano particles of hydroxyapatite, which is exactly what enamel is made out of. We know that the, the research is clear. The number one thing that we can do, this is an always, is for those high risk or extreme risk patients, fluoride varnish every three months. And that's the best thing that we can do. We have the best substantivity out of the fluoride, um, using it as the form of a varnish. And if you know, look at some of the research on that, fluoride varnish inhibited um, carries uh, 
substantial amount of caries, even non-cavitated lesions in both permanent and primary teeth. Um, and so there's a tremendous amount of research we could spend in, you know, an entire evening talking about that. Um, fluoride in terms of a 5,000 part per millimeter gel, um, obviously that's a, I, I think we're all probably all using those, recommending those, dispensing those, or prescribing those to patients. Tremendous amount of research on around 5,000 part per million fluoride. A 0.05 percent fluoride rinse, uh, a, a lot of research around that. This is an over-the-counter product, which is kind of attractive for that. Um, I mean, it makes it easier for patients to you know, follow through and use that. Um, the ADA, Council on Scientific Affairs, just did a, another uh, fluoride use and recommendations that was just published um, in JADA. It, I think it was either November or December issue. And they're recommending a 0.2% fluoride rinse once a week, looking at scientific data from the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. They're looking at really old research. They made that recommendation. Um, it's based on research. The research is old in my book, but at the same point in time, that then again is a prescription product. Uh, so I'm not saying don't do it or don't use it. It has value. It's only a once a week rinse based on studies on children in the schools, but um, that may not be something that's necessary. Certainly we have enough research, and I've um, spoken to a number of different researchers about this who felt comfortable staying with the 0.05% fluoride rinse. And then antimicrobial agents. Uh, I used chlorhexidine at the out at the out start, you know, this. Um, I didn't really see the results that I was looking for. I switched to povidone iodine in about 2001, 2002. Povidone iodine as a antimicrobial rinse. Uh, if you think anything tastes bad, until you've rinsed your mouth with betadine, a surgical scrub, you have no idea. Uh, the problem with betadine, it has a number of problems. Iodine allergies to being one of them. It stains everything that it comes in contact with, including formica and floors, clothing. Uh, you can only use it once a month, and the study that um, Doug Young and his group did at UOP found that it actually had an outcome on children, but it had no effect really in terms of adults when they when they tested it uh, clinically. And the problem for children is that uh, it goes in and it comes right back out. So I abandoned that in favor of sodium hypochlorite. Now the ADA Council on Scientific Affairs looked at non-fluoride preventive agents in September of 2011 in JADA and looked at you know, all the other non-fluoride caries preventive agents. And what they found was that there was weak evidence for xylitol chewing gum, chlorhexidine thymol varnish every three months for root surface caries. That's not something we even get in the United States. And all other chlorhexidine in any form for any lesion site for any age is in red letters, and this is the first time I've seen this, is not recommended. Now I know that um, John Featherstone still recommends chlorhexidine. Uh, if you've taken this program, this is something John and I disagree on, and we're, we're kind of in the planning stages of putting a study together to actually look at that. Uh, but I came upon the, at the time, looked at some of this information from Jorgen Slots at uh, USC in the Peridol Department, and using sodium hypochlorite as an antimicrobial agent, uh, it's something that doesn't produce resistant bacteria, it has no adverse host effects, and it's you know something that we've been using for safely for like 80 years. The downside of that is that it doesn't taste so great. But it, it's broad spectrum and, it, and it's, it's safe to use. So we actually did a three-year clinical trial on high-risk, carries risk school children in Australia. Uh, Carrie Hallett was the lead researcher on that study. Um, parts of it have been published. Parts of it have been, uh, the rest of it have been submitted for publication. But what we found was that looking at a 0.05% fluoride rinse, comparing it in a, as that was the placebo, to the carry free treatment rinse, we found a 73% reduction over a three-year period of time just using that rinse once a day at school. That was the only intervention in the study. So that's a significant reduction in dental care, and so we know, I have a strong confidence in the fact that that works. Xylitol, I'm a strong advocate of xylitol. xylitol um, I think there's a lot of research that indicates xylitol aids and stops the transmission of the disease from mother to child. So, you know, it, inhibits uh, the metabolism of bacteria, prevents the bacteria from sticking to the teeth. I mean, there's just a lot of positive things that it does. Um, and then we came up, um, we know that fluoride and xylitol together, xylitol potentiates even low, con very low concentrations of fluoride. So it has a synergistic effect. So it makes sense for us to start combine, combining some of these therapies together in a product. And then we came up to January a year ago and the, and the Bader sugar study that came out um, on, it was the exact study, the xylitol for adult caries trial, and they, it was a three 
multi-site study. They took 300 adults, uh, 33 months. They gave took these high caries risk patients, and they gave them five xylitol mints. Well, not xylitol gum, but they gave them five xylitol mints per day. That was the only intervention in the therapy. And at the end of it, there was no outcome. There was no difference in the people that had xylitol mints and the people that did not. And so I got more emails and response from this one study last year, a year ago than I have probably in all the studies that I've, I've focused on or shared or that have been published in the previous 10 years. And the people that you know came out and said, aha, see, we told you xylitol doesn't work. And then there were the xylitol advocates that were frustrated and concerned because you know here's a study that shows the xylitol doesn't work. Well, you know, if you go back to the targeted therapy, when I said earlier tonight, you know, if we just give a blanket therapy to the entire usual suspects, if it's not something that addresses directly what the problem, the why is for that person, their issue, if it doesn't, if it's not directed to their issue, it's not going to help. There's going to be no outcome. So when you look at a population and you've got all these multitudes of different issues, I would not expect any one therapy. I don't care if it's fluoride, xylitol, uh, pH. I don't care what it is, Danny. I, n not a single one of them is going to have an outcome that's going to be really significant for all patients. Um, uh, the, Can the I ask you one question that, about the test, Ken? I'm sorry. Yeah. Just a, a quick question. Uh, the, the, xyl the study where the xylitol potentiated small amounts of fluoride, was there any testing to, like, or were those lozenges that were used? I'm just wondering, like, the chemical versus the mechanical, or possibly there was an increase of saliva because of they were chewing. I mean, what if you just ingested it directly? Do you think? Were there any tests? No, it would be, and I, and I wouldn't think they, and there wouldn't be much of a chemical effect from it. Most of it would be from a direct exposure, Danny, in the mouth. And the, and the fact that it was mints and not gum may have been significant. Like gum, we know, would produce more saliva. Increase, and some of the effect from xylitol gum may be, may be because of the increased salivary flow, the stimulated saliva. Um, but just the mint itself didn't produce any outcome. But mm -hmm. this is where it gets interesting. And this is the study that most people didn't see on secondary analysis of their data, and then this was published in June, and most people didn't see this study. This was published in June then in the Journal of Dental Research. The patients in this study, in the xylitol arm, developed 40% fewer root surface cavities than those in the placebo arm. 40% from just as, I would, that, that shocked me. Like, I wouldn't expect that high of a result. Like, typically when we see fluoride studies, they're 29 to 30, 32 percent. So to just take xylitol mints, you get 40 percent reduction in root surface lesions. So what this tells you is for somebody with a root surface lesions, that's their problem. That's the expression of their disease. And there may be, that may be a xerostomic issue. Uh, more likely than not, you're talking about a senior citizen. Um, you know, medication due to xerostomia, there could be some genetic issues there. Um, xylitol mint would be a very good targeted therapy strategy for them, right? But that's, a, again, when they got to the targeted individuals who are high risk, and they, they found that this actually had a targeted outcome for certain individuals. So, um, again, so that, again, that goes to prove my point. There isn't going to be any one-size-fits-all one therapy that's going to treat and work for everybody. Sure. So, so from the same study, then, it, in my mind, it was a very strong, <laughs> supportive study for xylitol. pH strategies, uh, there haven't been a tremendous amount of studies done other than when we started talking about, Doug Young and I started talking about pH strategies uh, for th 13, 14 years ago, people kind of laughed at us. But this was all based on Philip Marsh's work from the, from the er late 1980s. And Philip really determined that um, it was the pH that caused the shift in the bacteria to favor the acidogenic, acid-uric bacteria that led to dental caries and not the availability of sugar. It was actually the pH that caused the shift. And so Doug and I looked at that research and I, and I thought, you know, if his research is correct, then, and, and, and how does Mother Nature deal with it? Why don't we start looking at raising the pH and see if that becomes part of our therapeutic strategy? And, and now I, more and more people are talking about it. You know, there have been a lot of papers published on it. Uh, even some of the, the large uh, manufacturers are starting to talk about neutralization in their television advertisements. So it's, uh, that, but that's a conversation that I think if we hadn't been pressing that, that probably wouldn't be going on right now. But I really believe that, again, that the, one, the interesting thing for Philip, and I, and I know him, uh, know him fairly well, 
the burning question for me was they published that when they shifted the pH down, um, the bacteria changed. And I said to him, well, what, what would happen if you just shifted the pH back up? And they were using a biofilm in uh, in vitro model. And he said, oh, we did that. And I said, well, what happened? He said, 10, years, 10 days later, it went right back to, to normal. I'm like, Phil, the, this was the most important part of your research, and they didn't publish it. Right? I mean, that was the most important part of that research in my mind. He was a researcher trying to figure out what was causing the problem. I'm a clinician trying to figure out how to solve it. And so they were just curious, but then they didn't publish that part of it. So that's, that's uh, just a, a side story there. One of the things that I tell patients and I've been advocating for years is like, if you can't do anything else, like after a meal or between meals, just rinse your mouth with water. Right? And I had a hygienist uh, a year ago. This was, this was new to me a year ago. I was lecturing at the midwinter meeting in Denver, and I had a hygienist in my audience say, you know, Kim, do you know what the pH of bottled water is? And I thought, uh, seven? You know, I mean, you know, water is water. Uh, you know, tap water is generally around 7.15, depending upon your community. I've tested a lot of different, you know, just tap waters. And uh, it turns out that is not the case. In fact, we went live right there at that moment in that, in that presentation to the Internet, and I did a Google search. There's three or four different sites that have tested the pH of bottled water. And what we know today is that people drink bottled water. And so, you know, here's the brands and the pH. And a lot of these are made by uh, Pepsi and Coca-Cola and soda manufacturers. And so they're bottling water that has a pH of 4.0. Just will be drinking, you know, diet soda or something else that's very acidic. So trying to neutralize your mouth, there are some waters that are above neutral and significantly above neutral, and so they're listed here. Um, I can give you that list if you're interested. Uh, you can just Google search it and look at the sites because it's very interesting. I was shocked. So I want to make sure when I have that conversation with my patient, go make sure that you're, you're rinsing your mouth out with a bottle of water that has a pH of 7.0 or higher. Or just use tap water. It has fluoride in it in most places. Now. Remineralization is another strategy. We talked about fluoride. We've gone through that. Remineralization is a strategy using uh, different forms of calcium and phosphate. And there are a number of different forms that are available on the market that are available in products. Um, I thought, you know, if we're going to do this, let's start with mother again. How does mother nature do it? Well, in the mouth, mother nature, there are a number of different forms of calcium phosphate in the saliva. But becoming part of the enamel, it has to be carbonated hydroxyapatite. And it actually enamel forms in a crystalline form, forms and, and demineralizes and remineralizes in the form of nanoparticles. If you look at this SEM here, those are actually little nanoparticles of hydroxyapatite crystal. They're about 20 nanometers in size. And that's what that, they're like the Lego building blocks of enamel. So I thought, why not just uh, start with that? So we uh, did a blind research study with uh, John Coys <coughs> at uh, his research center up in Seattle. I sent him some materials, and I said, I just want you to test this. We created some artificial lesions, applied these materials, and then you know went back and reevaluated them, and actually found uh, just in one exposure of nanoparticles of hydroxyapatite, them reattaching to the surface of these uh, um, artificially created lesions in, in vitro. So we're really talking then now about a new system using a risk assessment form. Here's the form that you know that I use that you know we helped create trying to come up with you know your diagnosis step of uh, you know I really like to think in terms of usual suspects and then you know creating putting products together what strategy would you implement for this patient based on what their issues are and at the end of that then how do we coach this person through that process because Danny that communication piece at the end of this you know it, it was a missing link I went all the way through handling the product I'd identified the problem, but I really didn't have the training to help them make maybe the behavioral change that was necessary for them to become healthy again. So I went through a, a wellness coaching program, educated myself on the communication skills of the coach, and then that again yet yeah, changed my practice, and now my entire, my entire team in my office has gone through the coaching process. So when we talk about the behavioral issues, we're talking about behavioral change. And of those, I would, I would off the top of my head tell you that there are two behavioral changes that are potentially modifiable. One is diet, the other is home care. And then the other behavior that patients have that may not be modifiable certainly would be um, if, if they've got, if they're taking medications, I can't take them off of their uh, medications. If they are special needs, I can't change that for them. 
All we can do is try and work with them, you know, through that process. But diet is a huge issue, as we talked about earlier today. And I talked about the, the systematic review on sugar. This paper was published a, a year ago, and the thing that I, I think was kind of shocking to me, and why I have it in in this group tonight for you, is that, you know, what they determined, which is no shock, is that more frequent toothbrushing, greater milk consumption at meals, and avoiding pre-sweetened cereal reduces the risk of developing dental caries. And in the study, <coughs> there was a, a tremendous segment of our population that eat Captain Crunch for dinner at night. There's a lot of children in this country that eat breakfast cereal not once a day, which would be bad enough, but they eat it two or three times a day. And, you know, I, that was for me, I, you know, we're very focused on what we eat and our, my grandchildren, you know, and so they don't get to eat uh, Captain Crunch or, or raise, you know, whatever Lucky Charms for dinner. And so you know, thought it's con it's uh, particularly unfortunate because the people do it because it's convenient. That's what they're raised on, and it's it, it's not that cheap. I mean, I haven't had cereal in the house in a long time, but I just happened to look at the price, and this stuff's expensive. Oh, it's, it's expensive. You can get a lot it's of seven, vegetables eight, seven or for five bucks a box. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah I mean four or five bucks a box. <laughs> Yeah, it's seven or eight dollars a box, right, for the cereal, and and it's you know it's, it's loaded with sugar, right? So anyway, that's just and an issue that I think. Sugar, high fructose corn syrup. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. So it's Danny. That's just something that you know we as a society are going to have to deal with, and then certainly even just diet sodas. You know, uh, in terms of enamel or mineral loss, um, there've been a number of really good studies. Rella Christensen did some really good work on this a couple of years ago, looking at the amount of mineral loss in teeth and these different beverages based on their pH. Um, Diet Coke actually scored fairly low, low in that study, but uh, Mountain Dew and Diet Mountain Dew were absolutely the worst, and they were off the chart bad. And it was because of the, you know, the citric acid that's in there chelates the calcium, as so not only are they dissolving the calcium, but they're chelating it, and so it doesn't get a chance to go back into the teeth. And so, you know, that's a, you know, some of the Arizona iced teas were particularly, uh, create a lot of damage in the enamel as well. So those are just issues, and, you know, we have the Mountain Dew generation, and, you know, we have patients that drink a lot of soda. We drink more soda in this, uh, in this country probably than milk or water, certainly probably combined. And, but even erosion, like Diet Coke or any of these other diet sodas, contributes to erosion, which is another problem uh, that, that we deal with. So even, you know, sweetened and non-sweetened beverages, if they're acidic, can be a problem. You know, interestingly enough, there hasn't been a lot of compelling information over the years that toothbrushing and flossing actually reduce the risk of dental caries. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure I have a number of hygienists on the line with us tonight. You know, there have not been a lot of studies that indicate flossing reduces the decay rate. And so it's like you look at that and go, okay, I'm telling my patient the floss, but I don't really have a lot of science to support that. Well, there have been a couple studies published in the last year, so before before I get your hackles up, you know, let me tell you that there are studies now. But this particular study I found very interesting. This was published uh, uh, last year in the Journal of Dental Research. This was a population study, 99,000 children in Scotland. And it, they followed this population for 22 years, and they looked at them, the ones that they taught how to brush their teeth in preschool before the age of five, reduced the DMFT score from three down to two while they got their, their permanent teeth in. And so that's, that's hugely significant, just teaching a child how to toothbrush before the age of five in school reduced the decay rate in their country by, by 30, 33%. So there are studies coming out, I mean, I'm not telling you that you know, home care, in my, I, I, I'm an advocate of home care, of brushing and flossing. But the problem that we have, you know, they're common sense and they make sense and we expect that they would have an outcome. Unfortunately, there hasn't been a tremendous amount of scientific research um, to support that. Sugar is just huge. And I, I mentioned it earlier. This is a study that was published a year and a half ago that, I, that was particularly alarming to me. They looked at dietary changes in the dental setting and in terms of rec making recommendations for you to you know, reduce the sugar, and found that it, it was easier for a patient to change their alcohol consumption than it was for, and that's a 12-step process, than it was to change their dietary behavior around sugar. And I mean, and that's a, a, a you know, it's a sobering, not not you know, no pun intended, 
But that's a sobering statistic that it's easier to change an alcohol behavior than it is a sugar behavior, particularly if it's a problem for one of our patients and it's driving this disease. And I think you guys have all familiar with a couple of studies that were published in the last year, you know, that have been on the news. Sugar is more, has a greater neural reward in the brain than cocaine. And this study that came out, I, and it was published this last year, and, and I know this hit the news channels, at, this was uh, Joseph Schrader at Connecticut College and his students. Rats favored Oreo cookies over cocaine. Given the choice between cocaine and Oreo cookies, the rats chose the cookies. So it's like it just tells us that we're genetically programmed to, to crave this material. And I think that probably, you know, something that a long time ago we wanted to load up on it when we had the opportunity and it was a seasonal event with, you know, with fruits and vegetables. But today it, it's a year-round event. It's a daily event. And so, you know, the sugar, it's addictive. And so that's an issue. So how do we help these patients get through this? Well, for me, that really came down to coaching. You know, I read several books on coaching, and I didn't really feel still that I had the skills that I was looking for. So I went, I looked at, at wellness coaching programs, uh, found there are two in the country that I, great programs, and the one I picked was Ferocia Knight. She's a world-renowned coach who's just written a definitive, what would probably be the definitive textbook on, on wellness coaching, and she's located in Portland, Oregon at the Brocken Institute. So if anybody wants more about that, this is somebody I could feel very comfortable referring you to uh, if you want to pursue coaching. She's trained my entire, my entire practice. Um, but, you know, we need to start asking open-ended questions. The problem for us in dentistry, we're, we ask the wrong questions. Do you floss? You know, we don't, you know, we don't ask, you know, how they're doing and how, you know, what, are you, what, what challenges are you having right at the moment. We don't ask open-ended questions. We don't, do you floss? Well, how many times a day do you floss? And, you know, everybody knows the right answer to that. And, you know, you don't get anywhere by asking those kind of closed-ended questions. We need to start asking them, you know, what would you like to focus on? You know, I'm your, I'm your health care practitioner. I'm your partner here in your dental health. You know, what do you want to focus on? You know, what's important to you? And hear it from the patient. <clears throat> what would you be willing to change? You know, what are you willing to do? You know, how would you benefit from that? Um, and I think at, at times we're really good at shaming people. And I hear this from so many patients. They're so embarrassed about the condition of their teeth. It's why they didn't come to the dentist. The last hygienist or dentist really shamed them over how poorly they've been, you know, taking care of themselves. And, you know, we're, we're, we're taught how to do that in dental school. You know, that's changed. But, I mean, from my generation, my era, we were taught to do that. And so we're really good at that, being critical and judgmental and, and shaming people. But that guilt doesn't make people change their behavior. The behavior they change is they stop coming to see you. We need to become less judgmental and start asking more open-ended questions. You know, that's really interesting. Tell me more about that. You know, people, when you start asking them about themselves or about that, and if it's a non-judgmental question like, gee, that's interesting. You know, tell me more about that. People open up and share with you with things that they probably wouldn't have shared with you otherwise. And so, you know, it's just a, I'm still having a conversation with a patient. I'm having a different conversation. You know, and one of the biggest things in that that I learned, um, I always had the treatment plan, and I had step 1, 2, 3 through 12 or whatever, right? I had my plan, and we do this first, and we do that second, and we do this third, and it was linear, and it was my plan, and here's and first you need to stop doing this, and then next we'll work on that. And in a coaching world, you know, you, you ask the patient, here, you know, here's three or four different things that you, we need to work on. Which one do you want to work on first? You know, where do you want to start? What's the most important one to you? And because given the choice, they're going to pick the one that the, that's most important to them and the best odds they'll be successful at it. Instead of them trying to fit them into my box, I'm going to try and fit the whole solution into their box so it works better for them. And that's really a coaching approach. And I have to tell you, it's very effective. Um, one of the challenges we've got with coaching when I started doing this a couple years ago is how do I get reimbursed for it? How do I, I, can't, I can't afford to spend an hour coaching a patient and not be paid for it. <clears throat> and what Ferocia has really helped design for us, and she and I are going to be working on it this year, is the seven-minute wellness coaching for the dental patient. And it's really more like a four-minute conversation. We're already having those four-minute conversations with our patients. Now we're just having a different conversation that's a lot more effective for them in terms of a, a dental carriage outcome. And, you know, the five parts of that are, you know, envisioning them as whole people. You know, seeing them as whole, complete people, that just happen to have a bunch of cavities. And educating them on what I see. 
here's what I see. I've done this risk assessment, and here are the things that are causing this problem for you. And then enrolling them, like, you know, you know, what's important to you? What do you want to focus on? Empowering them with things like, I, I can see you doing that. You know, encouraging them, being their cheerleader. You know, because we affect the outcome and behavior of patients. How many times have somebody, did somebody in your life encourage you to do something that you weren't really confident that you could do, but they, were, they believed in you so strong that you actually began and believed in yourself? And I think if you've ever experienced that, we have that same kind of power to help people and help our patients. And the last is engage them in the process. And it's like, where do you want to start? How would you do this? What would the first step be? And let them solve it. Because if they figure it out, and while you're coaching them, much higher likelihood that they're going to be successful and have it sustainable. Developing a new habit takes, what, 28 days? I mean, depending upon what literature you read. Uh, losing the new habit takes three days. So to create a behavioral change that's not sustainable, and the work that comes out of you know the Cleveland Clinic, Danny, that you know we saw um, presented to us, you know at the at the AOS meeting last year, um, from the Cleveland Clinic, it takes um, takes nine months to to develop a new sustainable habit, and it's not linear. There are starts and fits, and sometimes it needs daily contact. To you know, so we're we're kind of working through that process here, but. Uh, the coaching is really, in my mind, is the last piece for this puzzle for all of us. So I started tonight with the usual suspects. You know, you know, I think we can forget about butane, streptococci, and lactobacillus. It's really bacteria, diet, saliva, and genetics. At, at the whole end of the day, it's really about the pH um, and that pattern recognition. And if we look at then our therapies, we take that daily. We've identified the issue for our patient, and it may be more than one issue. It may be diet and home care. It may be diet and um, and a medication. It may be uh, just a bacterial load on their teeth, and you know, and maybe they have a genetic susceptibility. You know, so it may be more than one thing. But if you go back and look at our scientific progress, you know, everything was intuitive to start with. When we first started practicing dentistry, early years of dentistry it was intuitive. Well, I kind of think you've got this, and and I and I, I've got a gut feeling if I help you do this, it's going to make you better. And then we got to a point with scientific research where it became empirical. It became probabilistic. I know that if I see this symptom, you've got an 88% chance that you're going to have another cavity you know, within the next 12 months. And I know that if I give you this fluoride rinse, that's going to reduce the risk by 27%. Um, and it becomes probabilistic. The problem with empirical is we give everybody the same so you know, the chlorhexidine rinse and fluoride treatment. It's just the one size fits all. Or we just give them xylitol mints. And we saw how well that worked in that study. And we're really now at a point where we can personalize this and target that therapy specifically to the issue that patient has. So I want to share these last couple of patients with you tonight. And I hope this will bring all of this home and, and what the opportunity here is for you in this journey, what's possible for you. These are both mid-30-something women, patients, new patients to me. They're both high risk for dental caries. Now, I think you can appreciate the patient on the left has a different issue than the patient on the right. And yet, in the intuitive medicine model, you know, we would drill fill and tell them to brush and floss. Both of these patients have been through that with their previous professionals. They drilled and filled the cavities, and they told them they need to brush and floss more. Well, the lady on the right flosses twice a day, and I believe her, right? And I mean, her teeth, she could, her teeth are clean enough. She could be a hygienist for crying out loud. That's not her problem. And if we go to the empirical model, we would give them both um, chlorhexidine and fluoride rinse. And the problem there is, you know, the chlorhexidine is probably going to help the patient on the left because that person has a bacterial problem. I can see the bacteria growing on their teeth. The person on the right, this isn't a bacterial issue. So to, to give them that product, uh, that therapy, is not going to help them. So when we go look at those large population studies or intervention studies on populations, if we haven't targeted our intervention within the study, we're going we're gonna to get a mixed result. And, and until we design study, scientific studies that way, which we are not doing yet, until we get to that point, and nobody really wants to have that conversation, but until we get to that point, we're going to see these poor outcomes you know, in our scientific research. And then we're going to just write it off like xylitol doesn't work. Well, it turns out it worked really well for people that had a problem with root surface lesions. And now we get down to personalized medicine. And so the patient on the left, they've got a dietary and a home care issue. I need to target my therapies. She, she would benefit from an antimicrobial issue. 
the patient on the right, this is a uh, this patient, this is strictly medication-induced uh, xerostomia, and her mother has Sjogren's syndrome. So I suggested that she go be tested for that, genetically tested for that. But here's a person who, where's the saliva in her mouth? I mean, there isn't any. And so she can brush and floss and do all this stuff and give her chlorhexane. It's not going to help her. What we need to help her with is changing the pH in her mouth, trying to help protect her, trying to replace the piece that's missing, which is the saliva and the benefit that it provides, and then try and just limit her exposure as well to help reduce her risk. So, you know, those are two entirely different strategies. Both of them are going to require, you know, some level of communication and coaching on your part. You know, some patients will take this and run with it. You don't have to help them at all. But the better that you are at the communication skills, that's an important piece. So we really want to talk about targeted therapy, where I identify the patient. So the suspects drive the, this is not rocket science, the suspects drive the treatment strategies. If they've got a bacterial problem, we're either talking about an antimicrobial agent and or a behavioral change. Um, if they've got a dietary issue, I'm going to talk about limiting sweets versus limiting their snacking. Um, if they've got a salivary issue, we're going to talk about making sure they stay hydrated during the day and trying to neutralize that mouth to help support the pH there. And again, just recognizing that they need to be really careful with exposure to things like sugar. And if, it's, if we suspect there's a genetic issue and there are geographic patterns, some that you can identify, again, the same thing. We just need to minimize their exposure and try and support wellness as much as we can for the patient. So at the end of the day, bring this all home for you here tonight, your restorative success in your practice doesn't depend on which bonding agent you use, which porcelain you use, which cement you're going to use. It, you know, the, your restorative success for these high caries with dental patients depends upon how we manage the biology in their mouth. And we have a system. Uh, it works. We're much more effective at it than, than we've been before. And we can take these patients and help make them healthy. And I have to tell you, it has a, a profound impact on their life and on your practice. And so that's what's possible. And that's the journey that, that's out there for you, waiting for you. So my question for you is, are you ready? Ready to take this step? I mean, it's, it's really a simple process to get into. Uh, it can be overwhelming and, and seem like it's uh, um, confusing. But if you keep it simple, you can go through, work through this process. I've worked, uh, my team's worked with almost 5,000 practices that are doing this today. And I'm telling you, if I can do it, you can do it. I'll leave you with this uh, final thought. Uh, this is my good friend, uh, Mickey Ortiz from Ensenada. Uh, he said to me, Kim, there are two words that will open many doors for you, push and pull. They are. So uh, if you're, you're excited, Danny, I, thank you so much for inviting me to, to, to be with everybody here tonight. Uh, there's an offer from Carry Free. Uh, if you would like to, this is called our breakout, uh, you know, breakthrough box. Um, if you'd like a breakthrough box, it's limited to new customers, limit one per practice in the United States only, but uh, you know, contact us and request that it has samples of the products. It has a copy of the, the book on balance that Bob Bowers and I wrote together on dental caries and what we know about it today. But it kind of gives you an outline of how you could simply implement a system like that in your practice. And if you just want more information or if you would like a webinar, you know, I have experienced uh, people here that have trained a lot of practices, help them work through, coach them through the process of implementing Canberra into their practice. And so if you'd like more information, just contact Carry Free as well and, and set up a webinar for your team. And, and that's free, by the way. So um, uh, if, there, if I can be a resource to you at any time, dealing with a patient, uh, trying to figure out, problem solve, or whatever, uh, don't hesitate to contact me as well. That's uh, it's like I say, this is my mission in life. Uh, this pandemic is not okay with me, and that's why I was with you all the night. So uh, God bless all of you. And Danny, thank you so much for inviting me to, to spend my time uh, on this webinar with you. The pleasure was ours, and uh, it's, it's not a mere platitude when I tell you that I, I know I speak for everyone in uh, thanking you. Uh, I know that it's uh, this is a... Uh, not just me speaking because I'm able to monitor the engagement of the audience and uh, the number of attendees actually steadily increased th throughout. And not only that, but we probably got more questions submitted than, than ever before. And I think people who know the, the theme and the uh, attempt for us to secure speakers is that we want them to demonstrate uh, a, a, a solid handle of their material, the clinical background, evidence-based, and then be able to 
turn it uh, full circle and make it practical and simple to implement. And, and Kim, you, again, have done that beautifully. And uh, that's what it's about. And we got a lot of questions. We're already over time, but I can see not too many people have left. So let's just dive in with a couple of quick questions. And if you can be as succinct as possible in your answers, we'll sure. get to that many more. Yep, I'd be happy First to. Question. First question, Kim, uh, should one do the restorations first and then treat the disease, or does it matter? You know, that's a question that, that – uh, that's a great question, Danny, by the way, and I get that question frequently. And I would tell you, um, I used to tell people, uh, treat the lesion first and then start, and then I – you know, Doug Young was telling people to treat the disease and, you know, while you're, while you're working on the lesions, and there is no scientific – study that says that's, that's evaluated whether there was a benefit doing one or the other. I would tell you start both. Just go after it. But what I would really tell you to do is ask the patient where they want to start and put them in control um, because I don't think it matters. I think what matters most is that you've got the patient in control uh, directing their therapy and picking which thing that they want to work on sequentially. Um, and, and I think that's going to be long term I'm trying to win the how many cavities I get filled today. Long term, if I can get that patient healthy and successful, that's the approach I want to take. Great question. Well, I, and I think related to that, because I think this has implications for uh, successful outcomes, which in turn should have implications for uh, people's confidence in making elective uh, decisions for their treatment. Uh, another attendee asks, in treating a patient's carries disease, what increase have you seen in more elective type procedures being requested? That was the shocking outcome. <laughs> that was the shocking outcome for me, Danny. And it, and it was really, I have to tell you, when I started this journey 15 years ago, I really thought I was putting myself out of business. It was kind of like the noble battle. And it was something, it was just it became my mission, right? It became my quest. And I really felt I'm putting myself out of business in the next 10, 15 years. And that's OK, because I'm going to you know, maybe want to retire or do something different in my life. And the shocking thing for me was, that not only was I, did I not put myself out of business, I'm busier today than I've ever been. And I'm busier doing larger restorative cases with predictable outcomes than I ever have done before in my practice. And it was the, one of the first patients that I got healthy. She had been this, had a decay issue for forever. I, you know, my clumsy talking to her, that, you know, a long time ago trying to work through this process. And, and I got her healthy, and she didn't have a cavity for like a couple of years. And she said to me, she said, you know, is it, can I have that, can you do that five-unit bridge for me now? Which I had proposed to her for, she's been a patient of mine for 30 years. I proposed that bridge to her so many times that it got to be a game, right? And she'd always say <laughs> no. And so I said to her, I said, why, you know, <laughs> are, you, are, you, are, you, are you playing me here? I mean, are you teasing me? Or why, why would you want to do that now? I mean, you've lived all these years without that bridge. She says to me, because now I know that it's going to last. Mm -hmm. And it was like, and it was like, Danny, it was, that was an epiphany moment for me. It was one of those moments when the light went on. I went, oh, I get it. The reason that a lot of patients, they don't have the confidence. And how many times do you see it happen? You know, you put like those six crowns in that patient I showed you. Within a year or two of them have already broken off. You know, she said to me, now I know that it's going to last. And so when you get a patient through this, I'll tell you the real growth in your practice from treating this, there's a lot of treatment to do on these patients to start with. But when you get them healthy, there's, it's remarkable the amount of shocking, the amount of elective dentistry that these people want. And I hear that time and time again from practitioners after they've been doing this for a few years. The one thing that starts to happen in their practice is they start seeing more and more large restorative cases. And I see a lot of people, you know, they go, how, you know, how do I do that? How do I handle these cases? And a lot of people end up going to, to like John Coy's to learn how to do, you know, do the confidence, uh, get, get their confidence in those kind of restorative skills. But I know they're going to get, huge, they're gonna get yeah, they're gonna but it's get, huge. Uh, more yeses. It is. Uh, I'm going to do something I never have before, just in the interest of time, just because a lot of okay. people submitted a lot of questions, just so they know that they're, they're being heard, even if they're not going to get the answer tonight. I'm going to read them, and I don't want you to respond, Kim. Okay. I just okay. want them to know that, th that they're being heard, and we will get these answers to you folks, I promise. Kim and I promise, right, Kim? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Dental erosion from GERD is an epidemic like dental caries, very difficult to control due to disconnect between medicine and dentistry, in my humble opinion. That's what IMHO means. Do you have any suggestions for this? I bet he does. Next question. 
What is your opinion about the comments to not brush teeth for 30 minutes after meals? Next question. Please explain again about the meaning of acid, acidogenic and acid, aciduric bacteria. What is the percent of nano CHAP in carry-free toothpastes? Will you, well, if they get the samples, they can probably see that for themselves. Right. Will you share your risk assessment form with the group? Is baking soda too abrasive to brush with once daily to help maintain neutral pH? I know it's killing you, Kim, but just hang in there. <laughs> These are great questions. I know. What is the best way to neutralize the pH of the mouth, and what methodology do you suggest for hydration? Uh, uh, what is this? Nice setup presentation with the break breakthrough box. Oh, um, are they available if I do the training with my four dental residents? Okay. Um, Absolutely. Is the, carry, is the caries meter efficacious? Is this being taught in dental schools today? I have a daughter, I guess, in dental school, and I am wondering if she will be learning this. And then uh, a couple more that I copied over here. Um, do you have a sense for how many insurers are reimbursing based on the 2014 CD key, CDT codes for carries risk? Are some of your products available resale? He, the gentleman noticed that your, one of your products was listed along with ACT and Listerine in one of the slides. And uh, how frequently do you advise testing patients? To what extent does it depend upon the level of risk at which they present initially? You spoke about issues associated with low pH bottle drinking water. How significant an issue is this? What should people Google to get info on levels? Will you share your four-minute script? Uh, let's see, when and how specifically does one get started? Uh, and I'm sure that we'll be able to provide them some guidance on that. Uh, which is more responsible for proclivity toward dental caries, presence of a given bacterium or absence of a given a certain gene or enzyme? How does too frequent eating as a contributor to caries relate to what seem to be standard nutritional science that frequent meals are important to preventing insulin resistance and other diet-related illnesses? What are the most oops, what are the most positive changes? Where do we go here? Now here's I struggle with the complexity of the conversations we need to have with patients. I think you talked about that very well and how to simplify it. And uh, I, I think that's it, uh, Kim. Lots of information. I guess we'll be keeping you busy a little bit beyond yeah. the presentation. Uh, but again, I, I want to thank you very sincerely for such an informative, important, and relevant presentation that was just so chock filled with practical and actionable steps that practices can immediately make or take, as well as for your generous offer. And I want to remind everyone to be watching for an email offering details on how they can apply to receive their CE credit. And I also ask that you please mark your calendars for Wednesday, February 26th at 6 p.m. Central Time when we will hear from Barry Raphael, DMD, PA, and Kelly L. Olson, PhD, who will co-present Saving Lives by Improving Sleep. Patient compliance begins with effective treatment. In the meantime, this is Danny Bobro. 